I'll go ahead and introduce the session today. So my name is Lane Dilla. I am part of the SAM Research Committee, and I am happy to help host today's session, Talk with a Biostatistician, part one of a multi-part series. So today we're going to focus on retrospective analysis, and our moderator is Dr. Kevin McGurk. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine at the Medical College of Wisconsin. Prior to pursuing medicine, he worked in an, as an elementary school teacher in the DC public school system. He received his medical degree from Virginia Tech and completed residency at Cook County, where he also see, served as chief resident. His professional interests include medical education, retrospective research, and medical humanities. He's also the MS3 EM Clerkship Director and a current recipient of the Joseph C. Karen Excellence in Teaching Award. So we're very happy to have him and I'm gonna turn it over to him and let him introduce the pan panelists and take it away from there. Thank you, Lane. Uh, so today we are fortunate to be joined by our two experts, Dr. Christine Ramden, who is a, a PhD and on the faculty at Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School, Department of Emergency Medicine. She has her PhD in biomedical informatics, and, and she has research interests in emergency medicine, addiction medicine, medical toxicology, pain medicine, and strokes. She's published several studies using big data sources, such as NHAMCS, HCUP, and NSSATS, and has worked with the NSDUH and TEDS dataset, along with several other local and national datasets. She has experience in conducting big data analyses and utilizing several different types of statistical methods. So we welcome her expertise. We are also joined today by Michael Makatonin, who is a fourth year medical student at George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences. Michael has been involved in data set and data science research throughout his medical school career, starting multi-institutional collaborations by drawing on skills he learned as a software engineer and a data science bootcamp instructor. Mr. Makatonin's nascent research career has earned him recognition in the field including research awards and plenaries at national conferences. He is passionate about the potential of data science research to inform and solve impactful problems and continues to mentor others in the field as an officer in the EMRA Research Committee and principal investigator at the George Washington University Healing Clinic, among other roles. So thank you both, Dr. Ramden and Michael, for joining us today. I'm excited about all that today's talk has to offer. Thank you all for those who are joining now and those who might be viewing this talk in the future. It's exciting to have a discussion that we hope might provide the framework to inform and improve our research and scholarly projects, and also to make all of us better appraisers of the literature. For those of you who are in today's session, we welcome your questions. This is meant to be, at least in part, an interactive experience. So please feel free to sprinkle those into the chat as you see. I'll do my best to try to stay on top of them. And if we miss them or have to move on, I'll try to circle back at the end with any time that we're afforded to try to address them then. All right, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our two expert panelists, and we'll kind of think first about big data sets. I mean, so much of retrospective research is influenced by your data set. I'm hoping you two can sort of give us a brief overview of how data sets are constructed and how data relationships are formed. Michael, you're the first on my screen, so we'll start with you. I mean, so for all of you folks that have had the menial job of data entry, which we all do whenever we're taking care of patients and clicking random checkboxes in our EHRs, you all know how hard it is to generate really large quantities of data. And so it's probably no surprise that a lot of the big data sets that you'll end up working with as a researcher in this field are data sets that are intended for a purpose other than your research, right? So EHR data sets, any kind of patient care data that's generated from them is not generated in order to allow you as a researcher to ask a question, but it's generated by a physician trying to take care of a patient, right? Anytime you're looking at an administrative data set, um, their motivation is to generate revenues, to create billing codes, right? And to give only the supporting information that's necessary in order to create, in order to achieve that outcome. And so a lot of the data sets that you'll work with, you just have to really dig deep into understanding kind of where that data comes from and why it was created in the first place, because that's going to inform a lot of the limitations that you're going to have. I think that's a pretty intro. I think Christine can take it away. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for doing that, Michael. You addressed a really important point there. So there's actually 
a lot of different data sets out there, data sets that have already been created, like Michael said, for different purposes, and data sets that have not been created that one can create. And I'll uh, go a little bit more into that. So to talk about things that currently exist, right? Michael said we have already our local EMR data, which can be, you can create a data set by telling your IT person that, you know, you want to look at this specific diagnosis for patients that were seen with this specific diagnosis within the last year. And you can generate a data set with specifically all those patients and whatever other fields your EMR might have, whether it's demographics, meds, et cetera. So that's one example of a data set you can generate. Other national data sets that me and Michael have worked a lot with that exist out there that, that have data that are collected for other reasons, such as the AMCs, which is abbreviated for National Hospital ambulatory medical care survey. That's an example of a data set, which its name is essentially a survey, a data set that was created from a survey. So for example, how that worked, there's a card, like a case card in which uh, the CDC created. And um, this card is like, or this questionnaire is uh, sent to um, a representative sample of EDs across the United States in which um, people are trained on how to go into um, the electronic health record and abstract specific information from patient charts. And all this data ultimately comes together in the end to form a data set. And then, you know, the CDC, um, whatever the mechanism is, has this, uh, you know, this group of statisticians who then uh, do some really complicated stats and then weight this data to say that, hey, if we were to collect this data from all the all the emergency departments across the United States, we anticipate this visit would be representative of like, you know, 20,000 visits or whatever. So that's one way. So uh, survey uh, surveys are a really popular way of collecting data. Um, I'll give you another example. Like for those of you that knows um, that work in addiction and you know about the SAMHSA data set. There are several of those, like the NSDUH data set, that's the National Survey um, for Drug and Health, I believe, and that's um, a survey to people across the United States, a representative population that's, again, weighted, and it, it asks um, specific questions to these people, and these people are incentivized to answer these questions. So they take the answers from the, the, the survey, and they essentially form a database, which is publicly available for us to use and, you know, extract meaningful information from. So this is like an example of self-reported data. Then there's like other subject specific databases, right? Like the National Poison Center databases, the NPDES databases. Those are, those are databases specifically created from poison center calls. So that's another valuable source of information. And so the way that works, as you know, many across the nation, I believe each state has a poison center and they have to have a log of all the cases that call to the poison center. So this database is created from those calls. So that's another example of how, you know, data is collected and input into a database and um, the output to give you an idea of how it looks. So just to take a step back. So the NAMCES database and the NSDUH database is one, they're publicly available online and available in several different formats. So like SPSS, SAS, whatever, several types of database softwares that you can think of, they're available in the R programming language. And, you know, each of these program languages also has like, you know, the ability like Excel to have like a database in the background where they, they can kind of store data and then you can kind of manipulate it. Uh, the NPDES, um, when you conduct a research project um, and they send uh, the data back to you, it comes out in a Microsoft Access. So Microsoft Access software, it comes back there. So there's like, just so many different, you know, ways data could be put into like different types of databases, so many different ways data are collected. Then I just want to spend just one extra minute talking about like, you know, prospective data entry about data that we collect. So outside the EMR, I'll give you an example. And some of you may have won grants through your emergency department. So we won a SAMHSA grant through which we were allowed to implement peer recovery coaches for patients with opioid use disorder. And the grants required us to collect metrics, but obviously we had to create a process through which we can collect these metrics real time. So we used a database software called REDCap through which we input all these different data variables that were we were required to collect. And REDCap has several different 
ways you can input data. Your data could be free response, it could be multiple choice, it could be drop down. So through creating these forms and then inputting data for each patient, survey softwares, REDCap, Microsoft Access, Qualtrics can allow you to create your own prospective database through which you can conduct research for, conduct further analysis. So th those are just a couple um, of many ways uh, data can be collected and how these data cassettes are constructed and how you can form relationships based on uh, the different data sets that are there. I mean, uh, one big thing I, we didn't mention was that relationships between data sets could be formed if there's a link. And one popular link is there's a patient identifier, such as, you know, MRN or date of birth. I don't know, Michael, I know we just spent a lot of time on this question. If you just want to give a quick sentence about how HCUP, for example, has that ability to like link data, and then we probably can move on to the next thing. I mean, so whenever we have data available in a data set, right? Whether you collect it through your REDCap or through a survey or through this, these big administrative data sets. The thing that's important to know, kind of putting my software engineering hat on for a second, is that the way the data is represented inside of these data sets is very different from how kind of Christine and Kevin and I and everybody else really thinks about data, right? And they're encapsulated in kind of these data relationships between two variables, right? And there's really only three kinds of data relationships you have to understand. The one-to-one, -one, the one-to-many, and the many-to-many, -many, okay? And if you understand these data relationships, you can understand kind of how to ask whatever data set is in front of you a question, right? So for so going through them kind of one by one, a one-to-one -one data relationship is when one variable can only have a relationship to one other entity inside of a different variable. An example of this is something like a social security number, right? Only one social security number belongs to Christine, and that social security number can't belong to anybody else. And, Chris, and Christine can't have any other social security number unless she's committing some kind of govern, government services fraud, right? Now, we can also have one-to-many relationships where I, for example, can have multiple scoops of ice cream. Granted, I'll get diabetes eventually, but I can pick to have no ice cream or I can pick to have one scoop of ice cream or two or three or four, and there's no limit, right? But each scoop of ice cream can only, that, that is related to me, can only be related to me, right? It can't, I can't have one scoop of ice cream that's related to both me and to the person next in line at the ice cream counter. And then there's many to many where one, and this is something like favorite flavors of ice cream, right? I can have multiple ice cream flavors that I like, and each ice cream flavor that somebody likes can have multiple people who like it. And so the reason I kind of digress into this, these data relationships is because they allow you then to ask questions about how you can link your data sets and how you can transform your data. For example, Christine was talking about the HCUP data set. The wonderful thing there is that there is this column called, that's a patient identifier, that in theory is unique to every patient in a particular data set. So what does that mean? That means that a, a patient entity and this patient identifier have a one-to-one -one relationship. And so if I'm asking something like, how many visits does a patient have in per year in the emergency department? I can say, okay, there's a one-to-one -one relationship between this patient identifier and the patient, right? So really I have to ask the question, how many emergency visits are associated with a single patient identifier, with every unique patient identifier. And then that's a one-to-many relationship, right? Every visit is only associated with one patient, but one patient can be associated with zero to infinity visits. And so now I can aggregate um, looking at every patient identifier and matching it to the patient visit rows based on which patient identifier they're associated with. The nice thing is that there are a lot of really smart people on YouTube that explain this stuff a lot better than I do. So if you're planning on doing a lot of work in this stuff, I really recommend uh, going and checking and really understanding these three types of data relationships because they'll help you with your questions. Sort of build off that stuff for our participants, our viewers who maybe don't share your wealth of experience working with these data sets. And I'd like for you to try to take sort of a 10,000 foot view for those who are not as facile with these data sets as you guys are, as these are, these are potentially large data sets, they can sometimes be sort of unwieldy. How do you think about using these data sets to answer specific clinical questions? How do you, how do you sort of approach that process? I think, tr especially when you're just starting out, trial and error is a wonderful, wonderful tool, 
so if you have a data set, let's say we have the HCRP data set, okay? And you're asking, you know, hey, I wonder how much these patients are spending on medical care in a year, given some patient population that you're interested in, right? How much are opioid users? How much are patients with opioid use disorder that come into my ED actually spending on medical care in a given calendar year on average, right? So I go to the HCRP data set and I say, okay, can I try to answer this question with my data? And so I look through the data that I have and I see, okay, I've got ED visits and I've got, you know, ambulatory care visits and I've got inpatient hospitalizations. And so I can add all of those guys up and I can get a total cost of care. And then I go and I do that for a month or so. And then I realize, wait a second, I'm actually not capturing all of the costs that would be associated with that patient's care, right? Because HCUP doesn't include things like primary care visits, for example. And so then I have to ask myself the question, you know, is this still a question that's worth answering? And are there more interesting questions that have kind of come up as I'm sifting through all of my data that I actually want to focus, that are more interesting to me than my original? Or is this just a bad data set for my question, and I have to think about a data set that includes, you know, some other stuff. And both answers are okay. And if I decide, you know, I need a new data set, now I have more information about exactly what it is that I'm looking for in a data set, and I can, you know, narrow my search a little bit better. And, you know, as you repeat this process, and as you start kind of getting a little bit more hands-on experience with your data questions, that's kind of where you just, you start becoming better. And this process of iteration takes less and less time every time. Christine, as someone who has a wealth of experience working with a lot of different data sets and tackling some of these, I'm wondering if you can speak to how do you approach trying to identify outcome measures that you want to look at from these data sets? Yeah. So this is really interesting. So for me, I've gone both ways. I kind of, first of all, sometimes I look at the data set especially if I haven't been exposed to it before. And I kind of look at the variables it has and I'm like, hey, this is a really cool variable. This is something I'm really interested in. And that by itself forms the research question for me. And that becomes the outcome. For example, I published a paper last year for the first time using the NSATS database. When the NSATS database is a SAMHSA database, it's also, it's a survey of substance use treatment centers. And one of my interests is pain management. So in, for patients with addiction. So I, I looked at the database and I looked at the all variables. I'm like, oh my gosh, there's a question directly asking whether this facility has chronic pain treatment services. And I'm like, great, this is my research question right here. What is the prevalence of such uh, facilities and um, what are the factors that impact it? So that by itself, just looking at the database and the variables sometimes, but just by looking at it, you identify things that you're interested in and that helps form your research question and whatever outcomes you want to look at. It also goes the other way, right? So sometimes like a, a person that's interested in substance use disorders, there's probably certain things you're interested in, like whether it's alcohol use disorder, whether it's opioid and benzodiazepine co-prescribing. And sometimes you just have these research questions and you have to, based on the research questions, you identify the particular database that would be appropriate for uh, determining that. Like if I want to look at opioid and benzodiazepine prescribing, um, database that occurs to me is NAMSES because I know that's uh, emergency medicine database and that's primarily where the data comes from is emergency departments. So essentially you go there and then you know NAMSES by default and that's I know it by default but it might not, but might not be everyone. So if you're a brand new researcher and you just know the names of the databases but you don't know if the database can um, answer your research question or has the outcomes you're looking for, I would suggest going to whatever website the data is available on and they all have like a data dictionary or some mechanism through which you can identify what data points or what variables are in that database. And that will help you determine whether that database can help you answer your question. And um, so like once you have a specific um, question, for example, like my opiate and benzodiazepine um, example, I look in NAMCES, I see that NAMCES list out all the uh, medications and through um, you determine what years you want to look at, and then you just kind of take it from there. You apply your stats and do what, whatever not. You um, So just essentially looking at the variables in the database can help you pick out, um, number one, whether I can answer my question, and number two, does the variable have the outcomes that I'm interested or I want to look at? And also number three, which probably we'll go into later, does it, um, if I'm able to answer my question, does the database also have the variables that will help me 
figure out whether there's any confounders that might affect my outcome that I need to adjust for in my analysis. So I think um, that's really what it is. It's either you have a research question in mind and you have to figure out what database you have if it has that information or it goes the other way around. You have the database and based on the database, you determine what outcomes you can look at and what research question you could have based on what data is available. I think that's a great segue into sort of our, our next question. And Mike, you had mentioned at the beginning that oftentimes these data sets are created for one purpose, and then we end up using them for something else as we sort of explore research questions and can do a lot of you know secondary analyses and things like that. What, what limitations do the two of you see, including stuff like the confounders that Christine mentioned or post hoc statistical tests, proxy variables? What sort of limitations do you see in using these data sets for secondary analyses? I mean, I think Christine can talk about the, the heavy duty statistics here uh, a lot better than I can, but I'll just take it kind of from a conceptual point of view, right? So let's say we're doing an analysis um, that's looking at homelessness in the emergency department, okay? And we know that these are vulnerable patients and we want to figure out how can we best support them. And so our first step is we're going to go to our IT department and we're going to ask for all of those ICD billing codes right? Because there's a homelessness code. There's a homelessness Z code that we can use in order to track this. And then we realize, wait a second, we've got 30 visits by patients experiencing homelessness in our ED over the last five years. That can't be right, right? And the reason that that's true is because this data set was made to, first of all, take care of patients, right? And some line, sometimes the patient's housing status wasn't asked by the physician or wasn't rele relevant to that patient's care. And then it was, it went through another layer of processing where the billers were looking for specific things that they could use inside of that chart to get the maximum payout possible from whoever was paying for that patient's care. And unfortunately, a homelessness Z code is just not something that contributes a lot to the, to the hospital's overall bill, billing for that patient, right? And so you're looking at this data and you're saying, this doesn't match my reality. And the reason is because that data set wasn't built for the kind of question you want to answer, right? And unfortunately, this isn't just something with administrative data. With surveys, you'll have other sources of biases. Um, I'm sure most of you folks are aware of, right? If I said, okay, this data set doesn't work for me. Let me do a survey in the emergency department. If I had a bunch of medical students dressed in white coats that the patients thought were responsible for their care, and could withdraw their care, asking questions about, hey, are you experiencing homelessness? Some of those patients might not be comfortable answering truthfully, right? If I don't have a field to include, if I have a field to include the, the examiners or the questioners gestalt about whether this patient is experiencing homelessness, that's a whole different can of worms. And there's a lot of biases that go on there. And so the problem is that when you're dealing with these data sets, you're kind of fixed in the biases that are baked into the data set because of how it was constructed. And you have to under, and so this comes up hopefully early on in your process of working with this data set is you have to ask yourself, the question that I am trying to ask is not going to be perfectly answered by this data set, 100%. Every data set has biases. But are the biases inherent to this data set okay for the, or not that impactful on the question that I'm trying to ask. And that's really the biggest thing that you can do to set yourself up for success in your analysis stage, is to ask that question. Christine, how do you see and navigate some of these limitations? Yeah, absolutely. I think a big thing here I wanna mention, so like even without trying too hard, about trying to figure out the limitations of the data set. Because for example, when I started working with a lot of these data sets, you don't know a lot of these limitations. Sometimes they're not very inherent until you think about them deeply later. Or I'm a PhD, so a lot of times I don't realize a lot of limitations until I at, um, talk to a clinician, like my boss was Dr. Nelson. So a lot of times, like clinical confounders, if you're like a PhD, you don't get it unless you talk to someone else. But like some limitations are very obvious. Like if you have a clinical question in mind. So I'll give you for an, an example based on your clinical question, if you just looking at the NAMSIS database. So if I wanted to do, let's go back to my opioid and benzodiazepine co-prescribing example. If my research question was focused on not necessarily 
what are the trends in opioid and benzodiazepine prescribing? But I also wanted to parse out what, how much MME are these patients being given and has that changed over time? One of the things I would need to know from the database are essentially what is the dose and what is the duration of opioids being prescribed? So then you look at the NAMSI's database and, you know, that was part of your original research question. And then you just automatically notice that hey, the medication's listed here, but there's no data on dose and duration, which by the way, and I'm telling you that's already a limitation of the NAMSIs. Like the, they tell you what medication the patient's given, being given, but they don't provide do, dose and duration. So like, depending on your question, like that question immediately, like I go into the database, I see medication, but then I'm looking for dose and duration. It's not there. So depending on the clinical question you're asking, number one, again, as Michael's saying, you have to be very careful. Does this database help me answer my question? If dose and duration, if MME is not really the main focus of your paper, then maybe you can exclude it and just put that in your limitation section. And if, if your primary goal is just to look at trends. However, if the goal is to see whether the MME prescribed has decreased over time, then really that database isn't very helpful to you and it's not helping to answer your question. So that's a huge limitation that you can't, you know, you can't go around and that's hard to explain to reviewers. So definitely just by looking at the clinical question sometimes and looking at what data you have available, you automatically can identify like what limitations are. And then taking that to like a secondary example, how Michael was kind of talking, how you can indirectly kind of work around things, like how he was giving the example of like, you know, this data isn't provided by the data database, but maybe I can survey providers and get that data. Sometimes data available in the database can help you indirectly answer another question by creating another variable, which can be dangerous, but I'll give you an example um, of that. So in the, the National Drug Use um, Health Survey, the NSDUH database, um, they ask questions about substance use behavior. So uh, they ask, for example, does ha have you used opioids in the last year or have you misused opioids in the last year? Have you used benzodiazepines in the last year? Have you misused benzodiazepines? in the last year. But if you're interested in something like poly substance use or co-use, and if there's no direct question that says, have you used both opioids and benzos in the last year, then that those questions are not directly helping you. But then you're like, hey, maybe I can form another variable based on what I have, like using the filtering operation to filter all those patients those respondents that said, yes, that I used opioids in the last year. And then on using that data set, you can create another filter and say, okay, of these patients, I want to see also who responded yes to the benzodiazepine question. And then create like, you know, a limited data set with that set of patients that responded both yeah, um, yes to both questions. You can actually create a brand new variable in the data set. Did this patient use both opioids and benzodiazepines in the last year, that could be your new question. Then you can label that as a binary outcome, zero for no and one for yes for each one of those patients, like throughout the data set. So that's, you know, an example of creating a new variable, like an indirect variable based on, um, you know, the data that's already variable. Now, that sounds like great to answer questions, but there are severe limitations to that, right? Like, for example, just because the patient answered yes to both questions, Number one, you know, it's a danger of, you know, self-reported data with Nesta, for one thing. That's number one. So you, there's always reporting bias there. But at the same time, like, okay, what if the patient did use both opioids and benzodiazepines in the last year? That doesn't tell us if they used it together. Did they use it separately? Was one prescription, was one not prescription? So like, while it's nice to create like these proxy or indirect variables based on the data you already have, it can also be very dangerous because you might not, you might be providing misleading data. So it's very important to be careful and understand the limitations of all these data sets, especially when they're self-reported and you're creating a variable based on data that's already there, but it might not be representative of the whole situation. It's really important to be careful with that. So um, again, I think it really comes down to what clinical question you're asking and whether the you want to say the risks outweigh the benefits or do the limitations outweigh the value of doing the study. So that's something to be very careful of. And the other piece of it is confounders. Like a lot of clinical questions you might ask outside of prescribing, if you're looking at a particular clinical outcomes and or prescribing behavior and factors that might affect it. Is the database capturing all the confounders that you need to address, right? 
because if it's a severe confounder that you're not addressing, that may affect your outcome. Like you can't say X led to Y, but you didn't adjust for this. The reviewer will come back and tell you that. So if your your database doesn't have that variable that you know that you need to adjust for in your analysis, that could be like you know very dangerous and misleading. The other thing is that if it does have that confounder you adjust for, you want to make sure you adjust for it by conducting like a sensitivity analysis, right? So sensitivity analysis can take many forms depending on your research question it could take a, the form of a regression analysis to see whether or not you know that confounder had a statistically significant impact on the outcome people have many different statistical methods of addressing confounders but regression in the medical literature is one of the more popular ones so that's pretty much what i have to say about that so it's it's important to be very careful and again it depends on your question and what you think uh, might affect the results of your questions and how might this may be perceived by your reviewers I will also I will also jump in and say kind of because you know our our goal isn't just to create data set analyses right and, and to create and to teach you how to do this research but also how to appraise this research and so what Christine said is very important I just want to emphasize that when you're reading the literature when you're reading a data set analysis you have to be asking a lot of these questions you have to be asking where did the the data set come from and kind of what's the difference between how the data set was originally created and how is it being used now? And then you have to go through and look at their table one and really ask yourself, you know, because you're a clinician and you understand this problem space, is this population the same as what I'm seeing in my practice? And if so, are there big differences between the groups that they're comparing in terms of things like demographic variables or socioeconomic status or comorbidities that would explain the outcome that they got as well or better than the hypothesis that they're trying to support, right? Because at the end of the day, if you're telling me, okay, patients with heart failure die faster, but these patients also have um, on the table one lower socioeconomic status and higher rates of diabetes and increased ED revisits and no primary care doctors, right? All of these could also be contributing factors to this. And so when you're reading the literature, that first table is, and, and the method section, even though they're probably the driest portions of the whole manuscript are some of the most important to actually look through and appraise. And to, to sort of build on that and key in on something that you mentioned at, at sort of the beginning of your last answer, Christine, folks who inhabit primarily a clinical realm and folks who primarily inhabit a biostatistical realm might think about problems differently. And to, to use a, a medical analogy, an ounce of prevention is more than a pound of cure. For those of you who are viewing and thinking about how do I explore tackling some sort of research question, I would warmly encourage you to involve your biostatistician experts early rather than coming to them at the end with some sort of problem that cannot be readily rectified. Sometimes we don't, if you're approaching something from the, the lens of a, a clinician, you may not necessarily recognize some of the issues on the back end that the biostatistician would see right from the beginning and vice versa. So I would, I would encourage you to, to loop in their expertise early as you formulate not just kind of your questions, but how you're going to go about addressing them. So both of you touched on, on a lot of limitations here using secondary analyses and, and recognizing holes and how some of these data sets can be applied. Again, from kind of a 10,000 foot view, do, do you two see specific limitations in the kinds of questions that can be answered by a research data set? Mike, you're nodding vigorously, so we'll start with you. Anything that's been answered by an RCT probably won't be answered by you. So think back. I mean, I guess for me, it's a little bit more recent, but to the levels of evidence that, that all those librarians taught you in medical school, right? Data set analyses are really useful as initial kind of forays into a medical question. As a, we know nothing about this. Let's figure out if there's some kind of pattern here. But at the end of the day, because of all those holes and because of all those limitations that we described, as I said before, no data set, no matter how perfect it might seem, is going to be perfect. And there's going to be some biases that are going to be inherent to that data set. So generally, you want to be answering questions that don't already have some kind of robust answer. The other questions that are not as impossible to answer, but are very, very hard to answer, are those that are not easily tracked for other purposes. A good example of this is things like costs of care, 
weirdly enough, right? We talk about high value care and have been for decades and decades. And we're talking about how healthcare expenditures are going up. But when you actually ask for the number, right, how much has this visit cost the hospital or cost the healthcare system? Or even how much has this patient cost the healthcare system? You have a lot of proxy variables, but none of them are good, right? Charges are just made up numbers and you're going to have missing components, right? Because if you want to do cost of care, you don't just want to do how much does the primary care doctor bill, but also how many times does the patient have to stay home from work because they can't feel their feet? Or how many days do they miss of work because they're in the hospital? How much can they still take care of their grandparent who now needs a home health aid because they themselves are experiencing medical problems, right? And so when you go into these kind of thornier questions, the easiest questions to answer are the ones that have really good measure and where you don't need to make a lot of mental leaps between one vi the variable you're trying to actually figure out and the variable you can possibly measure. Anything to add to that, Christine? Yeah, no, I completely agree with Michael. And just to say it a little bit more explicitly, the best kinds of research questions that are best answered by databases are the ones that you have the data for, right? So if you're trying to create a variable, it might not be the best way to, you know, conduct your research question. The other thing, and what it's a, it's a big thing for me because I'm not clinical, think about, you know, if you're trying to answer a clinical question about like, you know, a particular uh, disease condition or something, if your, if your database is not taking into consideration, if it doesn't have variables that will help you figure out your confounders, then that might not be the best route for you to go. So again, it really depends on your clinical question. Going back to that NAMSI's example, again, with the opioid and benzodiazepine co-prescribing, if your primary outcome was looking at MME and how it changes over time, then clearly the NAMSI's database is not the best database to use and maybe no database because there's no database that comes to mind, national database that um, records MME, then, you know, that might not be the right database to use. And you have to really look at the variables, what data you have available and look at uh, the data that's not available and the data that could be used to you, um, useful to you um, in, help, in helping you properly answer your research question to determine whether or not using big data is the right answer for your question or doing it another way, whether it's utilizing EMR data or prospectively collecting your own data. So it really comes down to what you have and what you need to do a good job of answering your research question. Now, both of you have already sort of obliquely touched on some of these things, but when we think about conducting some sort of secondary analysis or analyses on some of these data sets, uh, what sort of statistical tests are, are we applying to, to answer these sorts of questions? So, I mean, the tests that you're applying, usually from the clinical side of view, and, you know, Christine is probably going to correct me on this. The simplest tests, the ones that everybody already knows and understands, are probably the best tests in that use case. And the way I think about this is that if I have heard of this like super complicated statistical modeling thing, you know, if I have to explain to you, for example, how ChatGPT works on the back end in order to tell you, you know, why I think these two pieces of text are more similar than others, that's going to be five pages of a method section that you're not going to want to read, right? And if you really need to understand that method section, as we've talked about, in order to understand, you know, why my argument is valid, that's just going to be a bad paper. So the best statistical tests to use are your t-tests, are your logistic regressions, are your chi-squares, are your linear regressions. The things that kind of all of us can really easily interpret because we've seen them over and over and over again. And usually for me, if I'm going a little bit beyond that, right, if I'm trying to use something a little bit more complicated, my first question is, what am I gaining and what am I losing, right? Kind of, if I'm gaining in complexity, then I really should also be gaining a lot in the validity of this test to my particular use case. Now, there is a flip side of that coin. And the flip side of that coin is that, especially with the tests that we all have grown to know and love, there are specific scenarios or specific assumptions that those tests make in order to have interpretable and valid results. The thing I usually kind of use to illustrate this is that if I have a curve that goes up and down and up and down and up and down, like those sine curves from algebra, and I try to do a linear regression on it, obviously the wrong test, right? It's gonna give me no information about this data set. It's gonna give me no useful, actionable stuff. It's just gonna think, 
oh, this is really noisy data that has no slope, right? Which is not what we're actually seeing in front of us. And so whenever you're using your t-test, for example, you have to actually do the due diligence to make sure that your data set is valid for that t-test. A really common pitfall actually is that a t-test, a student's t-test, assumes that the uh, variance inside of the two groups that you're comparing or kind of the width of those distributions is the same. And if it's not the same, then actually a student's t-test is not a valid test to use. And there's another kind of t-test called, called a Welch's that is more resilient to that. And in a lot of our data set analyses, you'll actually see because it's really messy real world data, those variances are not the same. These are different populations and our t-tests can't give us as good of a conclusion about them as we would like them to. So kind of a little bit of a nuanced answer, but on one hand, make sure you're keeping it as simple as humanly possible, but then you're also double checking that your data actually meets the assumptions that those simple tests. We'll go one step further into some of the nitty gritty, but but we'll do so with with some of the, the biostatistical basics. So I don't want to I don't want to get too lost in the weeds here, but but if you could, and we'll start with Christine, maybe give our audience a bit of a bird's eye view on how to think of some of the really basic statistical tests, some of the really commonly applied statistical tests, not just for a big data set analysis, but just sort of retrospective research in general that people can and should be using and how to decide what to use, some of these descriptive statistical tools, right? Absolutely. So just, yes, and this is direct continuation from Michael is saying, as you will see in medical literature, the simple, it is like you'll see the same tests used over and over and over again, the ones that we're mentioning. So those are definitely start. And I use the same statistical tests on big data sets and small data sets. The, the way to think about it is you have to look at what type of data you have. So if you're dealing with something like continuous variables, continuous, I mean like age or height, or you're dealing with categorical variables, that's like male or I mean gender or color or yeah, gender, color, um, race, ethnicity. Those are examples of categorical variables or ordinal variables. Those are like Likert scale variables, like one, two, three, four, five. Um, so depending on the type of variable you have, the type of variable helps you determine what statistical test to use. So if you're dealing with continuous variables like age and you know height, continuous variables you would use if you want to compare like two groups or before and after, you would use like, you know, your typical T-test or your man with you test or your Welch's test, depending on something called, as Michael was mentioning, data normality. So in addition to using these simple tests, you have to make sure you use them correctly. So data normality especially comes when you're dealing with the continuous data. So I don't know if anyone's taking notes, but I will mention it here because I know this is being recorded just to help people. But if you're like comparing continuous variables and you're trying to make a decision between man with me, you are Welch's or the t-test, which, which you need normal data for, you can use something called the Shapiro-Wilkes test to help you determine if your data is normal. And what that does is that it outputs a p-value. And if the p-value is greater than 0 0.05, it simply means that your data set's normal and you could use your t-tests or you could use any normally distributed test. Your data is essentially normally distributed. That's what it's telling you. If the p-value is less than 0 0.05, it means that your data is not normally distributed, right? And then if it's your data is not normally distributed, you have to use non-parametric tests for all your data, non-parametric mean like your man Whitney U test, your tests or medians, or your Welch's test, or whatever that test might not be. If you're not dealing with two groups, if you're dealing with three groups, you use that ANOVA test. I don't know if I'm, how many of you have heard of that. ANOVA tests, again, they're used for normally distributed data. If your Shapiro-Wilkes test tells you that your data is not normally distributed, then you have to use the non-parametric alternative for three or more groups, which is called your Kreskel-Wallis test. So it sounds like all a lot of words, but what it comes down to is number one, you have to look at the type of data you have. If it's um, ordinal data, if it's categorical data, or it's continuous data, and if it's continuous data, determine whether that data is normal or not normal. And based on that, you take it from there. Like you ask yourself the question, my data set's not normal. What's you, and I have two columns of data. What test do I need? Do I use the man, man with me? Can I use the man with me use test? If my data is like, if your data is normal, then you should be using the T test. If it's not normal, use the man with you test or the Welch's test. But if your data has more than two columns of data, if it has three columns of data, maybe you should be using the ANOVA test if it's normal or not normal Kreskel-Wallis test. So excuse me, that's the piece about data normality. 
for categorical data, you're primarily kind of looking at proportions, right? So if it's like male or female, what percent is normal? Um, what percent of the population is male? What percent of the population is female? If you're trying to compare the proportions, there's something called the chi-squared difference of proportions test. Or if you're putting that in your calculator and you get an error saying that it doesn't, you know, your data doesn't meet the criteria because the sample sizes are too small, the alternative is the Fisher's exact test. So essentially by just looking at your data and how many data points you have and looking at data and normality, if you like, you know, you use tools like, you know, stats textbooks or you use Google as a resource, it could help you determine what test specifically to use. For Likert scale data, it's the same thing. You have to determine data normality, and based on data normality, you're able to figure out what test. Others, common statistical tests, like our odds ratios, use your uh, typical regressions. Again, uh, there, there are some caveats with using regressions. Your dependent variables really depend on the type of regression you use. Like if your dependent variable is binary, you have to use like a binomial logistic regression. Again, this is really getting weedy, but in general, the idea is you just have to look at the data you have. And based on the data that you have and the data normality, that can kind of further help you figure out what test to use. And you have so many resources for that, your biostatistician, Google. But a lot of the times, even the calculators will help you kind of figure out where you're going and if you're going on the right track or not. And I will say, this is a really good idea. Uh, make friends with your friendly neighborhood biostatistician, uh, buy them drinks, get them on your good side, <laughs> and ask them all the stats questions. The other quick resource that I will, that I want to plug with no financial conflicts and all that stuff is there's a YouTube channel called Stats Quest with Josh Starmer that explains a lot of the statistics behind the more complicated kinds of, it explains, you know, t-tests and logistic regressions, but it also explains a little bit of the more complicated algorithms that you might see once in a blue moon, unless you're surfing the computer science literature. And so it's a really kind of well-explained kind of starter kit while you're still getting your biostatisticians on your good side. So our, our viewers might be familiar with a lot of the statistical tests, at least in passing that, that Christine mentioned there, whether it's a line in a manuscript, like Shapiro-Wilkes test was used versus kind of this, the central statistical method that they apply, a man with a U or an ANOVA or whatever else. And we probably don't have time to deep dive into how each of those might be appropriately applied. So I wonder if we can take the opposite tact and you two might comment on any really common mistakes that you see novices make, any really obvious pitfalls that some of our viewers might be able to avoid with your guidance. The one thing I would suggest that folks not do and this is not less of a kind of specific statistical que test question, because as Christine said, for the most part, if you look at your data, eventually that will guide you to a close enough statistical test or the right statistical test. But remember, all of these tests have assumptions. And one of the assumptions is that you're not going on a fishing expedition. And what I mean by that is we've all had the feeling, oh my goodness, shiny new data set. I want to ask all of the questions. And so I'm just going to shotgun and analysis after analysis after analysis. And like all the clinicians here know, you know, when you order every lab test in the book and you scan everything in the body, something's gonna come up positive and it's not actually gonna be relevant to your patient care, right? The same is true with statistics. We're talking about these p-values being less than 0.05. What does that mean? That means that if you performed that amount, there's a, there's a less than 5% chance that the results that you're getting are just purely due to the randomness of the universe and the way that the sample happened to work out, right? If we follow that to its natural conclusion, that means that if I did a hundred analyses, five of those would be would turn up something, you know, because of the randomness of the universe and the way the samples turned out. So when you're doing these tests, make sure, or when you're looking at these data sets, we're telling you to kind of adjust and roll with the punches but it's really important to have some idea of the clinical question that you are trying to answer in mind before you go looking for patterns, because the patterns will be there. The question is whether they're actually meaningful outside of your data set and in your clinical practice. Christine, I want to take that, that same thought and just take it, uh, apply it to a slightly different question, which, which is, if you're looking at really big data sets, often you're going to find statistical significance or questions that may or may not actually have clinical relevance. I'm wondering how do you try to address that issue? How do you think through that issue? 
Right. So that's actually really important because um, a lot of people may know if you have a large enough amount of data, everything that you start comparing, you end up finding um, statistical significance. So it's very important to take this with a grain of salt. And if you're a PhD like me, you have to consult that with your clinician and see that does this have actually any, does this make sense? Does this have any clinical significance? So working with a lot of people, having a good group and not keeping the, your results internalized to yourself, that's really one thing to be helpful. Number too, you know, just keeping in mind that obviously when sometimes when you're working with a big data set, you're trying to compare two groups and it's a lot of data points, it's just the nature of statistics. You're going to find something that's statistical significant. So you want to make sure that you're not fishing, for example, you're trying not to fish for something. And if you do find a finding by coincidence or something, you just call it hypothesis generating that, you know, further investigation needs to be done on this, you know, on the clinical side or whatnot. In general, you just need to be very careful about what clinical question you're asking. And if, you know, just because you found something um, statistically significant doesn't mean you've adjusted all the confounders and which might affect that results in the first place. So you want to make sure that you're addressing those confounders as best as you can as well. Or you're, if you find something statistically significant, you're mentioning that in your limitation section that, you know what, we found this result. I just want to mention that, you know, our data set was really big, making it vulnerable to finding such a, a result. Further research needs to be done on this and that we did our best to take into consideration found, confounders or for whatever reason, we couldn't into take into consideration any founders, confounders. So this uh, data should be used for hypothesis generation for future studies for helping to power randomized control trials or whatnot. So just being very clear with your readers, very important and be uh, working with a large team and very being very cogniz cognizant of what your findings are and how you're reporting them out to the scientific world. A lot of really valuable insights there. We'll pause given just given time and, and we'll open the floor in our remaining four or five minutes to see if anyone has a, a burning question they want to drop into the chat. We'll give just a little bit of space for that or shout it out at this point. I mean, if not, we'll just quietly meditate for five minutes. So. Yes, yes. Stony silence does the body good. Well, it, it looks like maybe no burning questions right now. And so I just want to thank both of our panelists, Mike and Christine, for your insights, all the really valuable information you had to provide for our audience. And thank you to Dr. Dilla, Kayla, the SAEM team for helping to organize this. And uh, I hope you all have a, a happy and healthy Thanksgiving break. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you so much for organizing this. Thanks. Enjoy your Thanksgiving, everyone.